Bueno, Arratza León, Lucio Ey, está mi esquer y mi aquí, Orques Pinagatic, Antolacha y Gustio Ey, Suen Lanagatic, está Iñaki Marco en Combiragatic. Um, Benetan, posa un día de matendite men egotia, um, Suekin, Congreso Antan. Um, Benetan pena y matendite es de Itzaldi Osoa, Euskeras, um, inglés era pasate con Nais, ahora en Ordon, Parcatu, Maya. Um, I also want to thank, um, there are many people here that have helped me so much in my research over the years, as Inyaki said, I have been coming to the Basque Country since, you know, 1982 at least to do research and um, that research has only been possible because so many people helped me. Um, and many of them are here, and I want to do what I haven't really been able to do. I wrote in my book, but I wasn't able to do sort of like in a collective way, uh, like I can today, which is to thank so many people in Euskal Ginza and in town halls and, you know, technicos and just everyday people who've helped me to understand the situation of the Basque language and its evolution. So thank you, everyone. Um, uh, if I know anything, it's because of you, really. Um, so it's a real honor and pleasure for me to be here in this 100th anniversary um, to celebrate an, an institution, Usko Ikaskunsa, that has played such an important role in the um, future, in creating the future of the Basque country, in the history of the Basque country, and the constitution of a Basque scholarly community. Um, for me, particularly, um, uh, it has a, a particular meaning because the discovery of the Congresses of 1918 and 1922 of Usko Ikaskunsa was a very important moment in my early work um, on the history of the Basque language. I found these um, unbelievable to me. I found the um, copies of the Congresses in the University of California Berkeley Library, and I began to read them. and. Um, you know, the, the writings of Julio Urquijo, Urquijo and Luis de Elizalde and many others. And as you know, in the, in, if you've seen those conferences, um, it, they all bring all together all the different sections of the conference together so that language next to politics, next to social society and so on. So I got to really read about a moment that was a very key moment in the history of, um, of the Basque country and in the history of really the um, the making of a Basque uh, nation and also the standardization of the Basque language. So I had I discovered these um, books when I had come back from 15 months of field research that had been, was research for my doctoral um, work um, where I was studying just as I understood it, I was studying the recovery of the Basque language movement as an anthropologist by living with people who were you know, experiencing it, um, 1982, 1983, and as you may recall, that was a very auspicious time. You know, the Ley de Lusquera had just been passed. Um, there was a tremendous amount of activity and excitement about um, Basque. There was the activities of AEK, the Icastolas, Muscada um, de Anusqueras, conferences about Batua, the ADECO had just published El Conflicto Lingüístico en Euskadi, you know, it was, it was a tremendous year to be in the Basque Country um, for that research. So it was a new moment in 1982, 1983 for language revival then, as I think it is a new moment now. And I think, um, while I wrote this talk, before I was he heard the talks this morning, I really feel very convinced that there is a new moment now. There is a new feeling now, a new, a new era in a way, beginning with the um, with the discourses about Basque recovery. So what, why, to go back to the con congresses that I discovered from 1918 and 1922, um, I think what reading those, um, what those book, uh, the books and the ponencias really showed me was it helped me to understand some of the historical antecedents to what was happening in the early 80s um, that I was witnessing. Em, pasaridate abisua em, badagoela e, itzulpena ingelesez ondo jarritzerik ez duenaren txat e, itzulpena hartzeko aukera badagoela badazpada inork ba, itzaliaren mamia galdu ez dadin e, e, galdu ez dezan ba, 
Oixe, s'han de marcar tu. So, as I was saying, the 1918 and 22 conferences helped me to see the historical antecedents of what was happening. And why do I say that? Um, well, these early interventions that I was reading um, in 1918 and 22 revealed to me a group of intellectuals, professionals, teachers, lawyers, engineers, doctors, who saw themselves at a vital crossroads in the history of their country. Industrialization and rapid urbanization had created a chaotic social order and a host of social problems that they were confronting, things from pollution to urban congestion to labor and class antagonism and other issues. They were interested, these people who would come together in Onyati, um, in progress, in modernization, and in bringing a scientific and pragmatic orientation to creating a society and an economy and a language that could flourish in the new century ahead of them, while also preserving their unique cultural heritage and language. These were not antiquarians. They were not navel-gazing, lost in nostalgia for the past. Rather, they were attending scientific conferences, establishing relations with universities and libraries all over the world, and looking to bring home innovations in urban planning, agriculture, pedagogy, and more. So I think this is how it works. Um, some of these slides will have in Basque some of the uh, key ideas that I'll, that I'll be talking about. Um, what I saw, or what the conferences, the ponencias, let me see more specifically was the emergence of a distinctly modern understanding of language, which would begin to inform the strategies of language revitalization in the years ahead. They argued with their compatriots that folklore and festivals Praising and exhibiting the language and its traditions would no longer be enough. It was not only the beauty of the poetry or establishing the origins of the language that mattered most now. For ensuring the vast future, new forms of knowledge had to be gathered and new questions had to be answered. Questions like what class of people spoke Busquera, where was it spoken, and what was needed to be able to introduce Basque into institutions of higher learning into commerce and into industry. Ensuring the continuity of the Basque language, culture, and identity, they argued, required not simply patriotism, it required active intervention, study, and management. It was the beginning of a sociological and not just a philological understanding of the language. It is at Usko y Cascunza's first conferences, I believe, and what I argue in, in my book, that we encounter an articulated vision of language as an object that can and should be planned. This is the view, I think, that has shaped a lot of the priorities for so much of the 20 and 21st century of language revitalization efforts, and that helped to make measurement and the enumeration of speakers, demo linguistics, a key resource in diagnosing Euskera's future. St statistics became the heartbeat of Euskera. So much was accomplished under this vision of language, but as I said, we've, and as I think everyone here has been saying, we've come to a time where the limits of this particular um, uh, okay, oh, thank you. No? Okay. Um, we've come to a time where the limits of this particular kind of language-centered approach have become undeniable. The challenge for a 21st century language revitalization is to operate with a speaker or people-centered, not language-centered approach. And that's what I want to talk about primarily today. So I'll talk about a little bit what the speaker-centered approach uh, consists of, although I think already Paula Casares has, has talked about that in her, um, in her intervention. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about, the, at the end, about the community capitals um, you know, a framework that uh, has been proposed in the last couple of years here. Um, so the challenge is how to abandon the conventional notion of language that has been embedded in so much of language planning and in everyday ways of thinking and talking about language. We need to ask new questions beyond how many people know Basque or their demographic profiles, 
when and where they speak and how much, although I would say that this is still valuable for us to know. But to move forward in language revitalization must be based on a more anthropological understanding of language. And of course, I'm an anthropologist, so I'm going to advocate for the anthropological understanding. But I also want to say that much of what I'm going to say <laughs> sorry, I knew this would be difficult for her. I'm sorry if it's been difficult to follow. Um, okay, so I just wanted to say that a lot of what I'm going to say about the speaker-centered approach is really um, echoing and in dialogue with Yonemirin Hernandez's call for an anthropological understanding of language that she made almost 10 years ago in the um, journal BAT, Bata Liscaria. She articulated many of the basic premises of an anthropological approach, a vision of language that I'll be picking up on and elaborating. So I wanna recognize that um, antecedent here. This shift in focus from language to people and their means of living and creating community with language is a vital part, as I see it, of the E5 project that is being proposed. It is vital to the creation of a more inclusive imaginary, the imagined futures of, a com of the community that wants to live in some fashion or other with Basque. And so that is what I want to talk about. Do I do it like this? Oh, no. Okay. Okay, this next section is called Languages Are Not Seeds. <laughs> the problem for language revitalization rests centrally with the notion of both language and also the idea that language communities are bounded homogenous entities, as if they were things in the world that have lifespans and die. You know, this is a common way to talk about talk about language. This is the kind of language ideology that has informed much of the contemporary endangered language and minority language advocacy as we know it. First, let me say that I think that advocacy from organizations using that language ideology has done a lot for minority and endangered languages. Groups like Terra Lingua and many others have been very effective in raising awareness of the richness and value of language diversity. Their work has done a great deal to uh, advance the collection, documentation, and preservation of digital recordings of language, preserving them for posterity and future study, much like the underground seed vault that has been created in Norway, where the world's biodiversity of plants are safeguarded against future disasters. And here are just a couple of pictures from the, the seed vault of Norway. But languages really are not like seeds to be preserved. In a, in a really brilliant article, um, anthropologist Robert Moore deconstructs the epistemology of the digital archive, explaining how the architecture of the digital archive that is collecting specimens of different languages um, produces some important distortions about what languages, how languages are really lived by minority and endangered language speakers. What are these distortions? Oops, sorry. First, that they understand languages as these neatly bounded autonomous grammatical systems. And secondly, and very importantly, they erase the reality of the full range of multilingual, often multilingual resources that speakers of endangered languages actually use in their lives and that characterize the lives of people in communities where many minorita minoritized and endangered languages are spoken. So the anthropologist Robert Moore is really talking about endangered languages, many of which are indigenous. I think much of what he has to say applies in general for any minority language uh, community. I think we would do well to heed what the African linguist Sinfri Makoni calls the need to disinvent this understanding of language as we currently know it and to abandon the whole schema of concepts like mother tongue, native speakers, and reified languages that obscure the multiplicity and complexity of, of sociolinguistic practices. We need to take up a speaker-centered view of language. 
What does that mean? Linguistic anthropologists prefer to think of language not, languages not as things to be planned or seeds to be stored, but as social action. More than a set of grammatical rules and vocabulary, languages are an instrument in a dynamic practice, right? An instrument for the expression of identities and embedded in the dynamics of creating and maintaining social relationships, social hierarchies, and belonging in particular social groups. We've already heard that expressed in various ways today. Oops, okay, don't turn on, okay. Speech is relational. It connects us to people, right? It is shaped by and contributes to social hierarchy, and it is world-making, right? So as um, Yonamira Hernandez explained in her article, anthropologists give special importance to a couple of features I want to signal about language, indexicality and heteroglossia. Now these are um, especially the first term, not an everyday term for people to encounter, but I just, they just want to use them to, re, to remind us of a very basic thing about language. And that is that the significance or the meaning of what we, or, uh, our speech does not come just obviously from the denotational um, significance of the words, as is obvious to us, but also from the fact of the subtle aspects of all these other features of language, intonation, the particular vocabulary, morphological features in our language, our verbal strategies. All of these features are also, they have indexical properties. They point to social features that are associated with these particular features of language, right? That's the indexicality of language. It's never just the denotational, but also what it's pointing to of other usages and the social groups that use those elements of language, right? We're all very dexterous in doing this, in using language and in really unconsciously mobilizing the indexical uh, feature of language. And the heteroglossia is another term to, to refer to the fact, that, and Hernandez talks about this very well, um, explains it more fully than I'm going to, is that our usage of any feature of language is always also invoking previous usages or voices that are associated with these elements of language. So that language is, in a sense, full of voices, full of references to other usage, other groups that come before us, right? And we make very good use of this as speakers, and it's what gives speech such richness and complexity. This feature of language this aspect of language is very crucial to this being having a speaker-centered approach to language. To be speaker-centered is to recognize for, then that we need to broaden the field of vision to not focus on a language, the amount or the variety chosen, but rather to situate speakers' dynamic use of language in a larger understanding of their lives. Here then is um, how Yonamira Hernandez explains the shift in perspective. These are her, her questions about what the shift in perspective signifies, so I'll just let you read that for a minute. Okay. Um, so, to put in my own words, um, then we need to, as I said, situate the use of language in a broader context of the lives of, the, of speakers, um, in which um, what influences them is not, um, sorry, I'm just translating here from, <laughs> from Spanish that I had written this originally. Um, what, men, what, what we should be looking at, in other words, is not just you know, the code choice, which I think has been the biggest question that we've been asking, which language do they choose and why do they choose that? But all the m other elements that, Im that people are doing when they're speaking, all the other elements that they're, they're drawing upon when they're speaking. 
To get at that, then, if we want to understand what people are doing with language, which is the speaker-centered approach, we need another ap conceptual apparatus and a methodological apparatus that would include ethnographic studies based in the contextualized description of how people use language. So anthropologists really, in many ways, um, have left aside uh, the term language as a whole and now tend to use much more the concept of repertoires, right? Repertoires is our unit of analysis. Um, and also we tend to look at the idea of linguistic identity as not as something that is static that you get in, obtain early in your life and have for the rest of your life, but rather as ideas um, you know, we, we're, we're moving more towards notions of identity that are more dynamic, more performative, and towards the concept of a communicative repertoire, right? In a repertoire of a speaker, uh, it refers then to all the re linguistic resources that an, a speaker would have acquired and is able to use. This may consist of more than one language, but it can be also different registers, dialects, and other features, right? So repertoire over language. The sociolinguist um, Jan Blomart has written about this in very the notion of repertoire, and it's also being used quite a bit, for example, in the work being done in the United States on Latinos and the way in which they use Spanish and English and their, their complex um, and dexterous verbal repertoires. Um, one can look to the work of Jonathan Rosa, Nelson Flores, for just a couple of examples. The concept of repertoire can be useful for us to set aside then the, the focus on the measurement of the use of codes and to set aside um, also to one side the classification of speakers um, into speakers of one language or other and get dig more into what languages I say, what speakers I say are doing with their linguistic resources. This is what the speaker-centered approach is about. So given that we know that the, Basque, the population of Basque speakers has been changing and diversifying dramatically, we can also expect that the ways of relating to and speaking Basque have also diversified. There is, as we have heard today, and as I know that all of you know very well, a whole generation of people who have learned Basque outside of the home. They are the majority of young people today, and they have distinct profiles, distinct identifications, different ways of learning Basque, and along that, with that, different ways of engaging with Basque in their lives, with their coworkers, with their friends, with their children, with social media, and so on. As Hernanda stated back in 2008, the dichotomous view of Basques versus Spanish speakers and communities and identities do not serve us well in this context, if they ever did. So I just want to mention, give it a little example from the research project that I did with my colleagues, Estia Amorortu, Ana Ortega, and Johnny Gorigolzarri, on um, new speakers that we um, did a few years ago. Um, that was in a preliminary attempt to try to get, grasp the different ways that new speakers have uh, learned Basque and incorporated it into their lives and their identities. And so I just thought I'd, I'd give you three, just really quickly, again, three examples of three different kinds of new speakers and therefore three different ways of engaging uh, with Basque. And these are all pseudonyms of, of people that we interviewed um, in the new speaker project. And the first one, oh, I'll give the name Ramon. He was um, a carpenter. He is a carpenter in a small town. And he learned Basque in school, but he also learned a lot of Basque with his friends um, in, in um, actually in a church group, a siorsa group, um, and also in sports. So he really learned the local vernacular of Basque. He learned how to speak in Ica, and he was very proud of it. He said, you know, I'm a new speaker, but I'm more than that. I speak like the people here. And he, was, he was, uh, had the vernacular Basque, and he was proud of it and felt very integrated with the Basque-speaking community. On the other hand, we had a, a university professor who was from the um, Bilbao area, from a working class, largely Spanish-speaking part of Bilbao. And she had learned Basque very well. Um, she learned Batua. And um, when I asked her, would you want to learn vernacular Basque? Would you like to speak, you know, in more, in, you know, vernacular forms of, uh, uh, 
you know, that are spoken, not just the standard. She was like, I have no interest in that. This is all I, this is good for me, and I had to learn bass to do my job, and that's all I want to do. I don't use it in my everyday life outside of work. And then the person I'll call Meaden um, was about a 20-year-old. Um, these other people were about in their 40s. Meaden is in her 20s, and she's a university student. And she knows Basque and Spanish very well. She was schooled in immersion schools, and she controlled both languages quite well. And um, it was interesting what she had to say about Basque. She said, you know, I just don't want anybody to tell me what language I should speak. I speak whatever I want to speak, whenever I do, but I don't want to feel guilty about what language I choose, you know. So really, really very different profiles of, of the people that are all, in a sense, in this category of new speaker. Our, our research showed us that some feel identified and proud of their fluency in the local Euskaldun register, others that didn't aspire to that, to that fluency, um, and others who didn't have access to that, to, you know, local registers or local vernaculars. So a great deal of, of variety um, in that kind of um, world. Given that ways of speaking are vehicles for expressing our effective attachment to places, to particular communities of practice, to neighborhoods, and to activities, how can the planning of the E5 project going forward respect these and other varied kinds of attachments and ways of engaging with Basque that we have yet to encounter? That is a key question. How can, so I pose the question for myself this way, how can participatory planning create the possibilities for an expansive participation in the design of the future. So let me turn then to the speaker-centeredness as it relates to community capitals um, framework. The community capitals framework that is uh, currently uh, underway is an approach that you've already heard, so I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because Inyaki laid it out very well for those of you who are here this morning, is an approach bar borrowed from some of the newer forms of organizational management and planning, particularly affirmative inquiry and participatory design thinking. And I think we haven't said that much today about participatory design thinking, but I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Um, I want to say, comment first just a, a couple, about some of the things that I see as positive um, about this method that's being proposed, and also raise some concerns I have, and also what I see as some of the distinctive and positive strengths of the Basque language revival movement as a whole that I think would be wise to continue. So here are some of the features. First, the strategy of affirmative action that is used in the community capitals framework um, as Iñaki explained, starts from the premise of asking what are our strengths? What do we have that we can work with, right? T typically, language planning starts with deficit. What are the problems? What, where, where, where we don't have enough of Basque? Where do we need to, you know, supplement? And so instead of problems, it's a refocus to strengths, right? And it asks um, people to draw upon and imagine and, uh, and then therefore enable new scenarios for living in and with Basque. This is a very important shift in planning discourse, one that starts with an assessment of strengths, as I said, instead of deficits, and give rec gives recognition to the importance, I think, of emotions, desire in particular, as well as imagination, as we heard the young people talking about imagination, right? With an emphasis on the generative and the creative, right? The design approach that starts with desires provides the elements for imagining new kinds of linguistic futures distinct from uh, what is in linguistic anthropology called monoglot ideology. Um, that, that monoglot ideology, and I'll explain what that is, has reigned supreme. And this is the idea, monoglot ideology is not the same thing as monolingual. Okay. Monoglot means that it's this ideology that every language, it's a hierarchical idea of every language must have a norm and the norm is the preferred form of the language, right? Monoglot, one form is and a hierarchical view of those forms. It is also in, in folded into monoglot ideology into the very common uh, notion that has driven so much of our language ideology of one nation, one language, one people, right? So I think this model has the potential to move us 
outside of that kind of thinking, outside of that, that ideology. It lays open the question, what are the futures, in the plural, that the communities of speakers or aspiring speakers of small languages desire? It does not have to be the reproduction of the imaginary of a majority language. I believe that or, you know, this is what, to me, excites me about this approach. The possibility of an imaginary from the margins of my majority languages. An imaginary of language of, created from the perspective and the experiences of, a small, of small language communities could possibly have the potential to be something more radical and more liberatory. So as I said, I, I, um, I think there's a lot of potential here. Um, to, for this to be what scholars um, in design thinking call transition design. And I'll come back to that concept of transition design. But I want to mention two other positive features of the community capitals framework before I talk about that. Um, one is the idea of community that's being used. That, the, that it's the community that's the focus, but also not a community that's defined on the basis of a linguistic profile, not just best speakers of this profile or that profile. It's not linguistically defined nor ethnically defined identity. It is defined um, by a shared aspiration, really. Um, uh, it is a self-ascribed community of practice, people who come together not based on their identity, but on their common activity and goals. I especially applaud the commitment to polycentrism, to collecting various kinds of imagined scenarios from people active in different walks of life, and to synchronizing those goals rather than seeking uniformity in outlook. And finally, the commitment to participatory methods. The, you know, I heard from many people who are here that participated in the seminars that were taking place over the last two years about coming together with the balls and the post-its and putting together, you know, participating collectively in designing what futures might be, you know, what resources are there, and so on. So the ability to, I think, as an observer of the Basque language movement, let's see how I'm doing for time, okay. Um, the ability to mobilize popular participation in language revitalization has been, I think, one of the real strengths and positive attributes of the Basque language movement. This is something that I don't think has been very well known outside of Euskaleria. From the early mobilization of everyday citizens in Icastolas, the decentralized network of Euskaltegis and Gauescolas in the early AEK, to the later emergence of Euskera El Carteac, um, later grouped together in Topaguniak and more, this capacity that Bas have to come together, to form associations, to cooperate and work together, some of the values that um, uh, Gorka w mentioned uh, in his uh, intervention, this is truly a cultural resource that has served the language movement very well. Then, as now, community involvement, building consensus, and a sense of ownership in the process of reclaiming the language including tolerance for critique, asking questions, and reassessment of strategy. These are key, I think, to the resilience of this particular movement. So I will confess, then, this is really powerful things, positive things. I confess that I had a reaction that I bet other people have had uh, uh, to the concept of capital, right? I mean, we can't sort of like hear the word capital and not kind of go, hmm. Um, at the very least, you know, I mean, it is a word. It is a word. It, we don't want to make too much about words, but on the other hand, we don't want to ignore them either. And at the very least, I think that, you know, as we use the concept of community capitals, we want to bring to this analysis or to the use of these concepts and the evaluation of capital the always important recognition that access and benefits of capital are often unequal, right? So capital is just not there to be used by everyone equally. It's often a very unequal terrain. I prefer myself the term resources, um, and that's because, in part, I, you know, I think we live, and I, I, we, I, we do live, not just I think, we live in a neoliberalized economy in which the logics of the market have co and, the, and the language of the market have colonized a large part of our social world and value system. We are constantly being steered towards and participating in valuation systems based on market metrics. So colleagues of mine who are out there doing research with students, university students, about why they are learning languages, for example, 
f are finding that students talk very much about the value of language in terms of its market value, who talk about themselves as being entrepreneurs of, them, of their own lives, right? Accumulating assets, value added, right? So we, we see this language everywhere, and it's definitely in the world of language um, acquisition. So um, we could sell Basque that way, and I think you know there, there's good examples of that. And in the world we inhabit, it might be politically strategic, um, as uh, I know Siadeco has recently done, to quantify the economic value of Basque. If nothing else, that quantification that they, that they published, uh, some of you may have seen, um, was a spectacular refutation of the prejudice that small languages have no economic value. Of course they do, and it can be actually quantified, right? But I think these metrics and markets don't ultimately serve us very well. Um, it's right underneath me, but I'm covering it up. Um, we cannot forget that it is capitalism itself that has in many ways contributed to the value system and the political economy that works against small languages. So I, I want to encourage as radical a design imaginary as possible to become transition activists and designers for how to live in a small language. From my work over the last years, I see resources that can serve this movement very well. As I've said, the underlying social values of collective work, the capacity to mobilize, to innovate, the value placed on social solidarity are extraordinary in the Basque society and are tremendous assets. What other assets and contexts allow us to experience in what I want to call maybe even we could go so far as to call it an alternative ontology of language, another, by which I mean another way of imagining how to live with a language differently. And so I want to draw, um, even though a lot of people have done it, I want to go look at Berso Aritza as an example of a possible ontology, not because it is the only one, but it is one that I think works well for what I want to say. So Yonemir and Ananas interestingly also talks about Berso Aritza in her article as being a kind of, you know, microcosm of the Basque speaking community. Well, I want to talk about it not, not so much as a microcosm as much as a resource and a different way of living or experiencing Basque. Um, I say this because I observe in Berso Aritza, maybe you do as well, a stance towards language that is quite different from the dominant monoglot, monetized, inherently hierarchical language ideology that surrounds us. That was, awesome. that was a mouthful, I'll say it again. An alternative for, to the dominant monoglot, monetized, and inherently hierarchical language ideology that surrounds us. In Berso Aritza, um, one can see language as being conceived not so much as an individual possession as it is a kind of commons, right? Not as an object to be governed, an innumerable thing with rates of growth and decline, but as a place where imagination, creativity, and surprise prevail over the goals of parity with ma majority languages or the logic of standardized norms. Here is a potentially valuable resource to draw upon for imagining a more solidary and more playful relationship to Basque. I don't know which way I'm supposed to point it. Okay, so that is kind of what I was just saying. Okay. At the heart of improvisation, as you may know, for those of you who may read about improvisation, is a stance of yes and. That is, yet building upon the speech of those that come before them, this, this, you know, and going forward, right? This is the principle of dialogical co-creation, right? And this principle is what design thinking is at, at its best is about. I think we could take another example from Versailles. So it could be um, theater that was talked to us by one of the young people here. Theater is this space for imagination. Theater is this place for creativity with language and experiencing language as dialogical co-creation. So my final thoughts. In Reclaiming Bass, the book I wrote um, now a, f a few years ago, I said that language revitalization movements are never just preserving a language. Right? They are always also agents in shaping and changing how people understand what language is. This Congress, 100 years ago, helped to do exactly that. 
to launch the modern era of language planning. The E5 project using the community capitals framework presents us with a new methodology that seeks to be more open to imagination. And as I said, I want to encourage an alignment with transition thinking and transition design. And this is one of my favorite books in it, so I, I give you the title of um, this recent book um, talking about and describing transition design. The transition discourses and movement emerging in the global south and in the global north that are calling for a rupture with the capitalist and patriarchal logics of development and perpetual growth that are arguing for values of community, for values of well-being, um, um, have brought, you know, are, argue that there is no fixing to those systems of the past, that we must really we redefine well-being, or as they say in Latin America, el buen vivir, you know, that we must recognize not individualism, but radical interdependence. It is a transition to a paradigmatic, ontological shift in plural world making, transition design is. The transition activists do not say practically anything about where language might fit into this paradigmatic shift. We, you, all of us have to invent that bridge to create that dialogue with them. Like transition thinkers, I don't think we can find a place for small languages without an ontological or epistemological shift of the dominant ways of thinking about language and about life in capitalist modernity. These ways have not served small languages or really anyone very well. So much has been accomplished. You and the people before you have accomplished so much and it's really extraordinary. Um, as transition theorist Thomas Berry has said well, we are now between two stories. The old paradigm doesn't work, and the new one has yet to be defined. In language revitalization, it may be the same, it may be similar. It is time to design what living in a small language can mean today. So as this project moves forward, we can and should embrace the same responsibility that the members of the first Congress of Usko y Cascunza felt to be agents in shaping how language is understood by combining this process of not just design, but transition design that will have a pluralist, speaker-centered approach to language and a capacity to accept diverse ways of living in and with Euskera, from the Bersolari to the code-switching new speaker to the occasional user to this passive speaker, all is having a legitimate place in the larger social world of Basque. I think much of the success of this new and exciting venture will depend on how it is carried out and whether it can invite truly pluralist experiences from the margins as well as the center of Euskal Ginza. So thank you very much. Well, anyway, I can't get it to